Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Little quiz for you guys to start off this episode. Luke Glendening, Thomas Yurko, Kyle Quincy, Riley Shahan, and let's go Alexi Marchenko. What do all of those guys have in common? They were drafted by Ken Holland? Maybe. I don't know, but that's not what I'm going for here. Sadness. Just general sadness. Oh, well, hold, hold on. Riley Shahan was in there. I won't take that kind of slander for Drinky Winky. <laughs> One more guess. I, I honestly don't know. They are all players that uh, were iced by the Red Wings on the first game after the first game that the Red Wings played after the Winged Wheel podcast started almost eight years ago in 2015. February 14th, 2015, the Red Wings lost to the Winnipeg Jets. It was a 5-4 game. And those were some of the players on the roster, just to give everyone an idea of how long we've been doing this now. So I was right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sadness is right. <laughs> Goal scorers that game are a little bit happier. Nick, Nicholas Cronwall, Darren Helm, Glory B, uh, Pavel Datsuk, Pavel Datsuk again. So, yeah, uh, February 13th. It's currently the 12th, but the 13th is uh, Mark's eight years of the Winged Wheel podcast. That's craziness. That is. I know we do this every. Actually, I shouldn't say we do this every year. We actually we, we've <laughs> missed it. We've forgotten about it most years. But to know that when we started eight years ago. To have known that it was going to last this long would have been absolutely insane to say out loud. But here we are, all in the same room. Brad and I were talking last episode. We haven't killed each other. Yet. Yet. We've actually grown to the point. Uh, you were engaged, Brad? Yes. Now you're married. I'm getting married. Evan's getting married. There are two kids. That's it for now. <laughs> Evan, Evan and I are still staying far away. So that's eight years. We have over 600. I think we're closer to 610 or 615 episodes. 615 episodes. However, over 3 million listens and downloads. Uh, oh, about a million views on YouTube. Two kids. No playoff wins. No play. No, no. We saw the series. last one. No, series. no playoff series wins. Yeah, we did. Actually, you know what would have been depressing? It would have been happy for us to say, yeah, this podcast is going to grow as it did, become the, the world's biggest Red Wings podcast, one of the biggest independent hockey podcasts in the world. That's great. We would have been thrilled. It's still very surreal to subtle, us. Subtle flex, Ryan. No, no. But I, I, <laughs> I have to say it because I'm bad at saying it. But also, we would have to acknowledge that through all of that time, we wouldn't cover a single Detroit Red Wings playoff series Jeez. win in eight years. Oh boy. Well, at least there's one coming up real soon in all likelihood. Right, Ryan? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't – we're not making it to a decade as a podcast without one. Are we making it to a decade without seeing a playoff series win? Oh, that's not good. <laughs> uh, very likely, unfortunately. <laughs> all right, folks. Uh, that's enough tooting our own horn. Thank you for bearing uh, with me. Please know that that does not come naturally, but we have a very bad tendency of uh, missing milestones on the show. So we had to do it. Uh, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Eight years going strong. We're not stopping anytime soon. Here to talk to you about all things Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL. And just hanging out with these two chumps. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. We have very different definitions of the term going strong, but I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. If you hear any sniffles, uh, that's not Evan. It's the ghost that lives in the podcast studio. That's right. No, actually, the Red Wings traded for Shane Goss to spare. Like, very yeah. literally. They were kind of his connecting flight back to Detroit somehow. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, Evan's going to Uber him over there when we're done. Speaking of trades, there's uh, some news on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Uh, what we'll be talking about is uh, the Red Wings have won two straight since our last episode, beating Calgary and Vancouver. Uh, fun storylines coming out of there. As everyone predicted, Philip Zadina with the game winner against Calgary. Uh, Yanni Burgers was born out of the Vancouver post game. Uh, there's notes about Wallman and Raymond. Uh, Max Boltman of uh, the Athletic Detroit, our good friend, went straight to the source and talked to Jacob Verana. So um, uh, some notes on him. Uh, the Tyler Bertuzzi trade rumors have started to crop up. So uh, we have news on that. And then NHL news, trades, big trades. They saw what the NBA was doing and like, they said, well, we got to do our best to keep up with that. We can do 15% of that. That's all right. I'll take it. Tarasenko move. Chikrin, maybe by the time we're done recording, is going to move. 
This uh, has been the slowest breaking trade in the history of hockey. I think it's honestly Dustin Brown night that just ruined everything because they didn't. That was it. last night. It's been almost twenty four hours since then. Look, I said they're doing their best to keep up with the NBA. Not they're going to keep up with the NBA. Uh, are they? Are they really though? The, you know, by NHL standards, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, some other NHL news before we get into overtime. Uh, before that, a couple notes. First, we did a very quick turnaround auction for the February, uh, I believe it was 11th. Yeah, the February 11th game against Vancouver where we gave away two tickets uh, on behalf of the Winged Wheel podcast and a piece of merch, which was likely to be the flannel, and a meet and greet with Ken Daniels. And it actually happened to be Mickey Redmond as well in the booth, uh, or in the gondola, sorry. And uh, through that auction, we raised over seven hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, I didn't get confirmation from the winner that they wanted their name out there, so I won't say. It, but uh, they very generously donated the tickets back, and then one of the other bidders made another very generous additional donation to uh, get the tickets, and we added in another piece of merch there. So seven hundred and fifty dollars raised for the Jamie Daniels Foundation in just that one go. So thank you all so much. There are three more auctions like that coming before the end of the season. The next one will be for the February 25th game, I believe. Don't quote me on that. We'll post it in a short order here. Next up, Winged Wheel Podcast Night slash Day at the LCA. It's a partnered event between us and the Detroit Red Wings. So the Winged Wheel Podcast has teamed up with the Detroit Red Wings for the fourth edition of this event where we host a live edition of the Winged Wheel Podcast. It has featured special guests like Ken Daniels, who will be returning, uh, Mickey Redmond, uh, we have some extra special uh, goodies for you, uh, any ticket buyers this time, so stay tuned for what those are. You get a, uh, in addition to accessing the pregame uh, or maybe postgame, we'll let you know, live show uh, where there's merch, giveaways, prizes, Q&A, meet and greets, etc. It's all at Hockey Town Cafe. Your ticket obviously also gets you into the Detroit Red Wings game on Saturday, April 8th against the Pittsburgh Penguins. They're discounted tickets. You get a special Winged Wheel podcast discount and... Uh, a portion of the proceeds from your tickets benefits the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So you sit with other Winged Wheel podcast listeners. Uh, you get to meet the hosts if you uh, are weird like that. But more importantly, you'll, you'll want to meet the special guests. Uh, and it's a great time, and it'll be a fun way to close up the season. So uh, I have confirmation here. I'm looking. More tickets added in both the upper and lower bowls. So uh, the lower bowl has uh, tickets have been added in a bunch of sections there in the upper bowl. Uh, has some more tickets added. You have all sold out the gondola. So that is excellent, excellent news. Uh, so if you want to get your tickets, DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. Again, that's DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP, Saturday, April 8th. Get your tickets. They are going fast. All right. The Red Wings were visited by two uh, West Coast teams. The Calgary Flames came into town on Thursday. That was Philip Zadina's first game in the lineup. Uh, it was a game in all where I think the Flames outchanced Detroit. I don't, I don't want to say they dominated. I think they controlled play maybe. I got some flack for saying that they, they outplayed Detroit, and some folks disagree. But I think overall they did outchance Detroit. But Calgary's lack of scoring was really on display. Eh? Lack of finishing ability, a uh, problem close to our own hearts. But yeah, Calgary outshot Detroit by over double. Was um, it? Yeah, it was quite a bit. Yes, they controlled. Oh, it was 36 play. to 17, yeah, the yeah, shots. Yeah, they controlled the play mostly. Uh, Detroit was opportunistic. Detroit, again, this was kind of nice to see, not in the fact they got outplayed, but it kind of got back to what they were doing well in October and November, which is we're not controlling a lot of play, but we're limiting space in the neutral zone. We're limiting space in the home plate area in the D zone. It wasn't a masterpiece by any means, and, and a lot of the Red Wings' flaws were exposed, but... One of the things that they were doing very well early in the season did seem to be there and was, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, despite Calgary's chances, they only ended up with one goal. Yeah. Uh, Larkin actually broke through, I think, at a really good time late in the second period. Detroit has now taken to scoring at the end of periods, which is nice. Um, broke through on the power play. Uh, Perron found him and Larkin split the defense and was able to go, uh, I think, high short side for the power play goal. And then in the third period, Brad, like you tweeted out, just as we all predicted, Philip Zadina game winning goal. So good. Uh, he was up on a two on one with Sunquist, uh, essentially, and passed it off. And you can hear Mick on the broadcast just go, oh, <laughs> like 
Because Zadina really just does have to shoot more, trust his shot. We all made that noise. I was so mad when he passed that off. Thing is, though, he did create some really great space. And Sunquist made no mistake getting the pass back to him. Zadina buried it. And it was like, yeah, the net was wide open. The net was wide open because of the play he generated. And that was just such a monkey off his back. You could not have picked anything better in a low event hockey game where it was Zadina's first game back where he's rusty and he just needs anything to go his way than for him to score. The the LCA was rocking too. Like they were loud when that happened. Good to see. Phil deserves it. Admit it. There's part of you that thought he was going to miss that net. Brad, he it, was on top of the crease in an empty net, and I wasn't fully until it's positive in the net. it was until, going in. Until it's in, it crosses the goal line, I never know anymore. If, if you froze time and you drove to my house and said, hey, Ryan, I will give you two to one odds that he, like, uh, I'll pay out two to one odds if he misses this and you take that bet, I would have put money down. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly would have done it. I, and I don't root for Zadina's downfall. Like, I desperately want him to just have the most miraculous turn down, like, comeback player of the year. But it, let's be reasonable here. This was a great start. Awesome to see for Phil, Philip Zadina. Keep grinding it. Keep playing the right way. And please remember, folks, he has he broke his leg, and it doesn't seem like the recovery was the easiest thing for him physically. So uh, he's going to be rusty. So just to start off with that one goal, I'd say it's a pretty big accomplishment. Hey, he put it right in the center of the empty net. That's what you got to do. Thank God there wasn't a goalie there. <laughs> <laughs> a goal, uh, hey, you know what? Goalie got close. Vladar got close. Closer than com- for, uh, than I was comfortable with. Yeah. Good for him. Red Wings win. Uh, they pick off the Flames who have had... Man, they missed Matthew Kachuk. They doused the Flames, Ryan. It was right there. Doused it. What did I say? Picked off. Picked off. I could have said put out. I could have said smothered. I could have said doused. Eight years and still nothing. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> You'll get there. Uh, Another eight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Canucks came into town on Saturday where the Red Wings wore uh, their reverse retros again. And they won, which made four straight wins in the reverse retro jersey. For and Detroit. you're not wearing yours. It's sitting right over there. No I wonder you screwed up that pun. Oh, Brad, I'm never prepared. What do you? What else do you expect? I know you're not prepared. You've had that retro... Reverse retro jersey thing in your back pocket since that game ended yesterday, and yet the jersey's still sitting on your chair and not on I, you. I got to tell you, the studio's too hot. I looked at it, and I'm like, I'm way too warm. I did not temperature control enough today. Uh, the Red Wings ended up with a 5-2 win, a solid win over the Canucks, who, man. You know, there is some commentary from the Canucks section of the hockey media world where it was like, can't believe we lost like that to the Red Wings, which was funny because there's some commentary from the Red Wings uh, uh, Twitterverse and the, the social media sphere where everyone was like, yeah, it's a good win, but it was the Canucks. <laughs> that team is in dire straits. Cl- clearly there's a bubble surrounding Vancouver. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Remember how bad they were with Bo Horvat? <laughs> <laughs> Although Beauvillier did it score. Yep. And um, how many did the Red Wings score again? Yeah, five. <laughs> uh Dylan Larkin open scoring, what was it, like a minute and eight seconds into the game or something like that? It was very quick. Again, the Red Wings are flipping the script here, and I'm very much in favor of this trend. I will say it was impressive that Detroit got this win without Raymond or Wallman. Raymond missed his first professional NHL game. We'll tell you why in a little bit here, but I wasn't expecting them to dominate like this. Uh, Larkin open scoring a minute and eight to, uh, into the game, uh, assist to Sider and Sherratt, who had to play together uh, because Wallman was out. Uh, Larkin's been great shooting from that left side. And then Berggren not too long after where pretty pass from Sider across to Sherratt, who very smartly found um, Berggren, who, as he always is, right place, right time at the side of the net to to tap it in. And that was a, a, a display of all the things that go right for the Red Wings in the offensive zone. Sider, who can work the blue line really, really well. Sherratt, like we've talked about, when he has a puck on his stick, it doesn't matter what your criticisms are of his game. When he has a puck on his stick in the offensive zone, that's when he's at his best. And Berggren, just his hockey IQ is so good, man. That guy, watch his play off the puck. Watch where he puts himself. Watch where he puts his stick. It's not a coincidence that he's always there to collect a rebound or bang one in or, or redirect one in. He is just, he thinks the game so well. So that was uh, Detroit's opening to the game. Beauvillier uh, brought one in. 
uh, on the power play. And then Dylan Larkin actually nabbed a power play goal, which was good because the Red Wings power play started off poorly. I think the first three power play opportunities, they had one shot awarded to them, and that was even retroactive. They had to go back and count it. Uh, but Larkin got his second tally of the game, again, from the left side. And that was a big add another million to the contract game for Dylan Larkin. He's, I think the all-star break was good for him. Uh, I th- what, he, what was it, his hand or his wrist towards the end of last year? The all-star break must have been a nice little break for him to kind of re-energize. I thought it was his back. Yeah, from carrying the team. <laughs> for six, seven years now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Philip Ronick added a... Um, a really well placed shot. It broke a little scoring drought for him. It was kind of a, a perfectly placed shot through a screen. I think Cop was in front of the net, um, and then Berggren again got his second goal of the game, tenth of the season, which puts him at I think twenty one and a half goal pace over an eighty two game season. It's not terrible. Yeah, it's all right. I you know how I know uh, Red Wings Twitter was in a really good mood during this game, hmm. and and obviously a little bit coming off the Calgary game. Nobody pointed out that Philip Hronik's goal drought lasted almost the exact time frame. He was paired with Ben Schrott, and then the one game Schrott gets off his pairing, he scores. Mm. Well, no one would have known if now if he hadn't said that, Brad. What, do you cover this team? Jeez. <laughs> I mean, that's not the reason he was on a scoring drought, but I, th- I thought for sure it was going to get mentioned, and I wasn't going to be the one to mention it on Twitter because I didn't need that in my mentions on Saturday. So, Oh, no. But you know what? Like... There's so much noise around Sherratt. He is currently, again, like the criticisms, I think a lot of them are fair, but I think we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit when we get to the Raymond injury. I think it's a little much right now. Uh, but just to close out that game, uh, that was two strong games for Huso, where his he had that like godly level play at the start of the season. Uh, and then he came back down to, I don't even want to say bad, just like average, some games a little below average, some games a little above, but when you're playing behind the Red Wings... That doesn't make for a good save percentage, but he was great the past couple of games. And the Red Wings get two straight wins. Is this the first episode we've had with two wins? And since it's got to be since Christmas, at least. Let's see. When was the last time they had two straight wins? Um, January. Did that happen at all? Oh, first episode? Mm. Between, ep- yeah, two wins between episodes. I feel like there's been a lot of oh twos. Oh, one and ones and one and ones. Yeah, not between, like, be, they've had two straight wins, but not between episodes. Yeah. So we've been fortunate for this one. So that's what the Red Wings did uh, against Calgary and Vancouver. A couple solid wins. Again, great displays from Larkin and, and Berggren, uh, Sider and Sherratt. Credit to them. You know what? Uh, they do deserve credit. I don't think they were perfect. I think there were defensive lapses across the team as there usually are. But um, I think we saw the a better version of Sider and Sherratt in that one game than what we saw to start the season. Coming up, the Red Wings are on a lengthy road trip. Uh, They have, in order, Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Seattle, so that's the West Coast portion. Uh, A couple days off, and then Washington before they're back at home on the 23rd against the Rangers. So uh, Vancouver and Edmonton before uh, next episode, and then we'll be recording before Calgary uh, plays on Thursday. So, uh, yeah, quite a bit coming up. Detroit has some tough games. Not that Vancouver is going to be tough necessarily, even Calgary, but... um, that road trip's going to be pretty grueling for them. And they have to hope that Wallman and Raymond are back soon. Grueling for them. We're the ones who have to stay up till 1 in the damn morning. Oh, man. Again, I, I, I think I said this last episode. I, I miss the nostalgia of the rivalries of the Western Conference. I am glad they were in the Western Conference while I was young. Yeah. Like, I, I, it is grueling for sure now. Um, let's talk about why the... Well, actually, the Vancouver post game. It was Trevor Thompson on the on the Valley Sports Detroit post game was talking to Larkin, and uh, he <laughs> was talking to Larkin. Basically, asked him a question about Jonathan Berggren, and then you see Larkin like smirk, and then he goes, "Is that how you say his name?" <laughs> and they start cracking up. He's like, "I've been calling him Jonathan Be- uh, Jonathan Berggren," <laughs> and then they came out for the presser after the Red Wings uh, 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 media team were right on it, and they they. Uh, clipped it and posted the press conference right after where um, Larkin came out with Berger and they were together and uh, Lark sat down. And he went, hey, Trevor, we uh, we resolved it. We got the nickname now. It's uh, We had settled on Yanni Burgers, <laughs> which credit to Rowan. Uh, he's been calling him Johnny Burgers forever. So Yanni Burgers is where they landed. And then he's like, yeah, we're, we're calling him Yanni Burgers. And then Berger <laughs> sits down. And he goes, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> For how serious hockey players take themselves on the ice like big tough men like 
uh, media, uh, media neutral answers like, oh, run of the mill, like classic hockey men. They are the most unserious goofballs in terms of the people that they are. Like that's that's hockey dressing rooms right there. Oh, a thousand percent. And then wasn't there a follow up comment from Bagger who's like, I like hamburgers. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I like it. I like burgers. <laughs> it's such an easy team to love. Um, okay. Um, you've seen their uh You're just Brad, do you know what? Don't ruin the vibes. Is it is it is it like eight years no playoff series win? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and but no, but they're at least a like high volume entertaining team even when they lose, right? A lot, lot of things happening per game. Brad. I'm going to punch you in the neck for our eight-year anniversary. The reason Wallman and Raymond were out, first Wallman took a massive hit from Nikita Zadorov. Like just, I don't think Zadorov throws non-massive hits. No, he is a freight train. We looked it up before the podcast. He's 6'5". I'm actually impressed that, like, Wallman's no slouch. Like, he's not a little uh, small player. He's a wall man. Oh, he is a wall man. And they, they Zadorov went down too, and you can tell Wallman was... In some distress, I'm impressed and a little horrified that he came back to the game. I'm I'm surprised he got up from it and returned as well because those are two big bodies colliding and uh, they both kind of bounced off each other, which are usually the worst kind of hits for both parties. Yeah, yeah, that one you know, like everybody felt that the next day. Your nose was stinging. You're hearing like the the ringing in your ears. Your eyes have stars in them. I honestly, he played the rest of the game and throughout the whole time, I thought I honestly would not be surprised if he misses the next game. And lo and behold, he did. So you got to hope that that's not too long. And then Lucas Raymond in practice between the Calgary and Vancouver games, um, him and Sherratt got uh, tangled up. Apparently they were just reaching for a loose puck. Like Sherratt didn't do anything. I initially tweeted something out and then I deleted it because I didn't want people to pile on Sherratt because there's no confirmation as to what happened and everyone was getting very angry. And I'm like, hey, look, have your criticisms of Sherratt, but I don't think he went out and injured Lucas Raymond. And um, yeah, he, they were just reaching for a loose puck. So it's just one of those things that happens in practice, but kind of a bummer. It was um, like 130-ish, 132-ish NHL games in, and that was the first one Lucas Raymond has ever missed. I'll never catch Phil Kessel now. No, no, not the uh, cider still has a chance. Yeah, that's pretty much it. You've seen the way Satter plays. No, he doesn't. You know what? <laughs> but I keep thinking, man, if he was going to miss a game, he would have done so by now. Because he takes he no, he he's, he's winces still... and limps off after every shot he takes to the leg. Yeah, but he's he's still a child. Child children are made of rubber. Like, yeah. give him a few years. Yeah, you're you're not wrong. Um. All right. Also of note here, uh, it was really good. It's really good and fortunate that we have Max Boltman as uh, on the beat for the Red Wings because. We talked last episode about Verona, where essentially we just we didn't throw cold water on the reports that were coming out, but uh, you know we threw cold water on any of the certainty or the breaking news ish of it that was presented. And uh, Max did a great thing, and he actually went to Grand Rapids and talked to Jacob Verona to see what he knew. And a lot of it, it's really interesting. Go give it a read on the Athletic Detroit. I'll link it in the description of this episode. But it was really good because I think um, it's important for people to see how murky ambiguous um tense is i think the right word this whole situation is essentially verona said like what he said to max was um i don't know what the decisions are i don't know really what's happening all i'm doing is trying to make like play the right kind of game and play better uh it looks like ben simon and and the team over in grand rapids are really working on him focusing on his game not cheating on offense uh, doing the right things to produce the scoring, and and we're seeing the results of that now. He's been on a heater, um, and he says that's all I can focus on. I've not been told anything really at this point. Now, if you were told anything, or if you knew anything, would you say it? Uh, that's one thing. But I'm I'm pretty want to believe Verona when he says, you know, I'm proud to be a Detroit Red Wing. I want to play here the rest of my life. If you're a disgruntled player who wants to change the scenery, you don't exactly volunteer that in an interview. So I, that part made me a bit, honestly, it was a little hard to read. You really want the best for the guy and you hope he comes out of this. Uh, okay. And and again, like we said last episode, there's no definitive end result here that we know. I, I think the path back for him is narrow to the Red Wings um, long term. I, I don't, I don't think that's the most likely option to put it uh, lightly. Uh, 
but there's no definitive action or there's no definitive path forward here that that we know for sure but um yeah it just goes to show this whole thing is very fluid and we don't really know what's next for Jacob Verona and everything is on the table it's kind of weird that his boss don't you think it's from my perspective if my boss didn't know what the plan was for me i'd be very concerned when he says like i don't know what the decision decisions are like he was very diplomatic in that interview, but you For can sure. you can absolutely glean from that to say like, hey, this is you know there's a there's a big complicated aspect to this, and it's not just as we've talked about many times on this podcast, it's not just get better at hockey, get your legs back, whatever. Yeah, there's more. There's to more it. to it. Yeah. yeah. No, I just found that found that very strange, and I yeah. didn't know what you guys really thought on that one. It and that's the value of of going directly to the source again. I understand the. There's nothing wrong with being curious about the situation. I don't think anyone should be flamed for wanting to know more. I, you're a fan of the Red Wings. You want to know what's happening with their most talented goal scorer. Uh, but for anyone who pretends we have this report or I'm hearing or you know, good authority that this is happening definitely, like no, that no one knows definitely right now. There are very likely outcomes, but no one knows definitely, and I, I still think it's very fluid. All right, looks like trade season has started for Red Wings fans. You know, we talked about Tarasenko, or we mentioned that we're going to talk about Tarasenko and Chikrin, but um, it's starting to get a little bit noisy for Red Wings players. Obviously, what's been happening a lot is the Larkin thing, which, for good reason, I don't even think that's been, you know, BS reporting or anything. One of the premier UFA centers is uh, not signed, and we're getting at close to the trade deadline here. Um, but the news here is actually about Tyler Bertuzzi which is a little surprising to me. But Jeff Merrick on, uh, I believe, Hockey Night in Canada reported that um, there were – there's a healthy amount of trade interest for Tyler Bertuzzi to the tune of three teams, Dallas, Edmonton, and Tampa Bay, uh, having interest in Bertuzzi. So Dallas, Jim Nill, former Detroit Red Wings assistant GM, Edmonton, Ken Holland, former Red Wings GM, and Tampa Bay, Julian Brisebois, uh Steve Eisman's old stomping grounds and his uh, former assistant GM. So you can see the connections and in, in <laughs> why they're probably pretty high on Eisman's speed dial list. But yeah, those three teams were the ones noted so far as being interested in Bertuzzi. Uh, apparently Detroit, uh, according to Jeff Merrick, had some brief extension talks earlier this season, but nothing serious. That aligns with what we have heard uh, and mentioned a little while ago. Doesn't seem to have gone anywhere, which is news. And he believes Detroit is asking for something substantial in return for Bertuzzi. So the price, unsurprisingly, is set high to open negotiations. So initial thoughts. Let's just say initial thoughts on the amount of interest so far that's been noted about Bertuzzi. Skeptical? Is <laughs> No. Because <laughs> what happened here? Let's be honest. Eisenman playing 4D chess. He called up his old buddies. Hey, I'm not getting a lot of, a lot of calls in tile here. Can you guys just say... To, to yeah. someone that Brad, people are going to believe you. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's absolutely BS. No, it would make sense that those three teams would be interested. A, because obviously um, the NHL GMs above the GMs in every other sport are most comfortable dealing with their friends. So Dallas, Tampa, and Edmonton, unironically for the reasons you mentioned, would make sense. And yep. B, each of those teams makes sense from the way their roster is constructed. They have a need for someone like Tyler Bertuzzi. So, you know, it's that kind of perfect storm of it would be a comfortable trade partner for everybody involved, and there's a direct need for everybody involved. Now, these three teams are capped out, so it won't be just a simple Bertuzzi for a second-round pick trade. There's going to have to be salary retained, contracts coming back, that type of thing, because none of these teams can just fit Tyler Bertuzzi on their roster as it stands right now. Yep. So that is worth keeping in the back of your mind when you're coming up with trade proposals. Because, again, to me, the most likely scenario for Tyler Bertuzzi uh, would be just a straight-up second-round pick. That's kind of the vibe I've been getting. That can't happen with these three teams in particular. And most teams who are in the playoffs and and challenging for the Cup are also capped out. So this is going to be the norm in Tyler Bertuzzi trade talks um, versus a team that can just take him on at full pop. So, yeah, um, I'm a little surprised there's as much demand as there seems to be for Bertuzzi, given the season he's been having. I understand Eisenman's reasoning for asking for a substantial return. Where I am skeptical is that he will actually get 
a substantial return for Tyler Bertuzzi. I mean, depending on your your definition of substantial, for me, substantial is first round or better. I don't think that's happening in this scenario, but I've been pleasantly surprised before. Here's the thing. We've seen guys who have been brought in for specific roles for potential playoff teams and teams have paid a premium. Think of like the Barkley Goudreau types where teams are giving up first round picks for that kind of player and you're like, why? And then you see the role that they play. Like teams are basically game planning their most likely opponents for the first three rounds of the playoffs. They come in, they play that role, they they fit the bill because NHL hockey changes in the postseason. Everyone ridicules it. They come in and it actually plays out and then they lift the cup or make the cup finals or something. Sometimes those players are like bottom of the lineup, bottom six players, absolutely, and they do really well and they end up getting overpaid later on. And it's a story we've seen time and time again. And you're like, hey, kind of worth it because they got us a cup or two. Uh, Tyler Bertuzzi could be brought in under that same premise, but he also has the advantage of potentially being a very skilled, productive player. Like, for example, Dallas would want to bring him in reportedly to play with Tyler Sagan. He's a guy who can play with your best players and not drag them down and produce. You can really play up and down the lineup depending on what you really need out of him. And what you believe of him. And if you're a, a, an opposing GM who has stars in your eyes and, and you're saying, I really need a player who can grind but not hold down my offense, I mean, Tyler Bertuzzi, doesn't matter if you think he's that player or not right now. He fits that archetype or he, he fits that bill, maybe. That's what he has been. Steve Eisenman can sell it as, hey, the guy broke two hands, pulled a groin this year. He's going to be a little rusty. He also plays we have an ultra defensive system going on right now because we need to teach these guys you know, how to be responsible and not give away the puck and, and lose hockey games. So you're not going to see him put up the numbers, but you put him in your system where he's playing with Tyler Sagan or he's playing with Braden Point or he's playing with you know, Connor McDavid. I think he would thrive with Connor McDavid. Hot take, anyone would. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. How's he going to play with Connor McDavid when Connor McDavid's always two lines ahead of him? Yeah, hey, well, don't worry about it. Careers are, pick made, up the rebound. Car- careers are made on breakout passes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was, was going to say, Connor McDavid is going to have to do a full lap of the Ozone before Tyler gets there. To- Tyler, <laughs> s- you only skate straight north-south. Connor is going to do a couple loops around. You guys will cross the blue line at the same time. It'll be great. <laughs> he can play with those guys, and I think that's an easy sell for Steve Eisman. Uh, GMs oftentimes get stars in their eyes, especially when the opponents around them in the playoffs are adding. Someone's going to add Timo Meyer. The Rangers just added Tarasenko. Uh, Chikorin probably to LA here. We'll see. I don't know what's actually transpired since we started recording. Bertuzzi could be an underrated, presumably cheaper guy to add. And if Detroit has to retain on his contract and bring a contract back or whatever, I, I don't care. That's how I want Detroit to use their cap space. That does drive up the return. Right? And if you can use that to eke out a premium piece... I don't want people, like someone said, you know, Stankoven. I, I don't. Yes, please. That, yeah, that's <laughs> not happening. Sorry, I don't want to say that's not happening. That would be a haul. It would take, it should either take we a could lot. Do an, we could do an emergency podcast. Yeah, I'll we'll do that. That's how crazy it is. If we get Stankoven, you'll show up we'll for an emergency We'll do an emergency pod? podcast. I'll cancel my plans. <laughs> that's how crazy that really is. Yeah, I'll say it's not happening. <laughs> Why? Because Evans not doesn't show up for emergency podcast. Because Logan Stankovin's really damn good, and not many teams are going to pay a Logan Stankovin for a rental. No, you're exactly right. But I don't want to. I want. I don't want to completely rule it out. I think it has to be a combination of a fleece. Um, Detroit has to add to make it work in terms of contract. That's the way it happens. Is Detroit retains? The they take back a bad contract. Detroit maybe kicks in hypothetically Mata or like a mid-round pick or, or something to get yep. the value up to a, a stank of in. But generally speaking, teams aren't super interested in moving their top prospects. Okay, now all that said, as time goes on, maybe we'll get into a little bit more specific of what returns could be specific players. We don't think it's going to be... Actually, it's not likely what you're saying, Brad, that it's going to be this massive hall where they get a superstar prospect back what is in your mind the a likely return for tyler bertuzzi the athens you trade is what i'm kind of looking at best case scenario the red wings will take back a contract so let we can actually go right back to edmonton because this is probably the easiest example the athens you trade two second round picks and they took sam gagne's contract back in this scenario edmonton probably would be willing to give up two second round picks and the red wings could take back 
Huli Arvi's contract and retain on half of um, Bertuzzi, which would actually lower Edmonton's cap hit, which would then free them up to do something else if they so choose. They're not giving up a quote-unquote premium asset for Tyler Bertuzzi, but Detroit's getting pretty good value for what Bertuzzi's put out this season. Because, again, going back to the Athanasiu scenario, very different players but almost identical situations where coming off a 30-goal year, sky's the limit type of uh, vibes around the player, and then the next season just goes poorly for whatever reason. But there's still value because of the previous seasons, etc. That is my comparison right now, and I think that's probably along the lines of something that's going to happen here. Fun fact, the two second-round picks that came back to Detroit in exchange for Athens CU, uh, 2020 second-round pick, which the Red Wings traded it away and ended up being Brock Faber, who is now with Minnesota, I believe. LA moved him to Minnesota, was it? Yep. And a 2021 second-round pick, which the Red Wings moved to the Islanders as part of the Letty deal, which became Aturatu, and Aturatu is now with Vancouver. Funny, right? That, that That's not a fun trade tree. I think that's a very fun trade tree. It's fun. It's Lots good. of branches real fast. Yeah. Um, doesn't make me all happy and giddy, though. Hey, you surprised, how surprised were you by how impactful Sam Gagne was, though, for the Red Wings? Define impactful. Uh, he was, relatively he was, speaking. <laughs> he was very serviceable, and we love the guy. There's a lot of yucking of my yum this episode. It yes. Is. Right. 29, 35. <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah, dude, go. I love what Sam Gagne did for Detroit, but I'm upset if he's the best piece we got out of that trade. That I think the best point. thing that can really happen for the Red Wings with Tyler Bertuzzi is all the other teams continue to load up and other teams realize that and start to get a little spooked yeah. and really, you know, force their hand and need to get a Tyler Bertuzzi. Because if you look at a team like Tampa Bay, your window's not closing. But you don't exactly, I don't know, they're in a precarious spot. I could see them spending to make it work. Another wrinkle here I should add, and we've mentioned this in the past, Bertuzzi's border issues are not necessarily resolved. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, the Canadian side still has vaccination requirements. No, it's actually the American side that I don't know if they've technically dropped it yet. The Canadian teams aren't certain about what what happens. Like he's here. Uh, He's playing in the States so he can cross back and forth. But if he is in Canada and he's a Canadian, they don't know that he's going to be able to cross back and forth from Canada into the States easily. I would have to imagine that this does get resolved, uh, but it's not a certainty. So that could be a wrinkle for Canadian teams trying to trade for him. And, you know, with uh, Edmonton being one of them, uh, that could be a complication. Let's go on the assumption that it'll be resolved somehow. The, The lawyers are paid to to work all that out i agree though brad i i think i actually think it might be a little bit optimistic of a return to say two seconds and a like serviceable player not the serviceable player sam Gagne turned into a serviceable player i don't think that's what the player coming back will be i think it will be whatever contract that team wants to move the most i think more I think the focus here for me is less on what's most likely and it's on how wide open the range is. Like, I think there is a possibility slim though. It may be that the Red Wings get into, they're getting a really good prospect or first round pick or equivalent back. And I also think there's a possibility here that the market doesn't behave in a way where there ends up being any bidding war for Tyler Bertuzzi, or maybe the border issue does become problematic or whatever it might be. And the most they can muster is like a third and a fourth or something like that. The Red Wings are moving Bertuzzi. In all likelihood, nothing is certain. Anything can change. Maybe he comes to the the table and says, you know, here's this team-friendly contract, short or medium term, who knows. But all indications right now are that the Red Wings want to get some kind of value out of Bertuzzi before he walks to free agency. I don't know. There's, It's a world of possibilities here. I will call it a win for Detroit that there are even three teams noted as being interested right now. It's more than I would have assumed in like December when things were looking bleak for Burt. And there's teams that do come out of nowhere all of a sudden and oh, yeah. just strong arm their way into getting a player after they've missed out on X, Y, and Z. Yep. So the situation obviously is very fluid and I think it'll it's gonna be a very interesting trade when when I when it happens, I think it will happen. Cause look at who's a, a premier winger on the market right now that teams are 
essentially they might be considered the log jam, which is Timo Meyer, right? But Timo Meyer comes with, I think, his own quirks. He has a ten million dollar qualifying offer for next year. He's going to drive. He's a phenomenal player. Like we joke that he would be great for Detroit. I don't think Detroit's in the really the sphere of teams who, who are really competing for him. I could see it happening. Um, I think playoff teams would be pissed off if that happened. Uh, but Timo Meyer could make things interesting. And if he moves early, then that's more time to focus on guys like Tyler Bertuzzi. Um, yeah, you kind of need those chips to fall more rapidly than they have been. I mean, Tarasenko helps, obviously. Yeah. Um, Patrick Kane looks like his hip is scaring teams away. Jonathan Taves as well. Yep. He's not been practiced due to non-COVID-related illness, apparently. So, I don't I know. I think the quicker those guys start to move, the the price drives up on Tyler Bertuzzi because it's supply and demand. Yep. I skated past something, and I, I guess I shouldn't say that without getting your opinions first, but I said it's not too likely that the Red Wings signed Bertuzzi. Do you see a path forward for that? Slim to none. There would have been more talks by now. Yeah. Yeah. The indications we have from you know talking to folks is that this was always going to be the most likely outcome of the season, but yeah, I don't know. I think I'm just relieved. Like after you go back a month, did you see – hear how depressed I sounded on the podcast about the Red Wings rebuild. And it's because just of, a month ago. Right? Yeah, just a month. I've been chipper ever since uh, because the value from Verona went away in a possible trade and Bertuzzi looked like the same thing. So this is good. It, it bodes well and, and Detroit has something to play with here. They, Steve Eisman, and you know what? I'll, I'll go so far as to say Steve Eisman, it's almost imperative that he makes the most of this here. This is not a, um, a low risk move. Like you need to capitalize on the amount of value you get from a Tyler this Bertuzzi is a cornerstone player. year for sure. Mm-hmm. This, the asset management this year sets the sets the course for everybody else coming up. Yeah. You don't have to return a Connor Bedard level prospect for Tyler Bertuzzi. That'd be nice. It'd be good. Yeah. Maybe we should send a note to the Red Wings to say try to do that. Um, but you do need to make sure that you don't lose players of that caliber for nothing. Otherwise, yeah, that is just an opportunity come and gone. Yep. It'll be fun. Nice of the trade season to get started early for us. All right, let's talk about the uh, other trades. Tarasenko, hell of a deal, uh, moved over to uh, New York. He requested a trade from St. Louis. God, how many years ago was it now? About so, two years ago, yeah. give or take. It's when he had that sh- shoulder surgery, right? Like yeah. he wasn't happy how the team sort of handled it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So Tarasenko went to the Rangers at 50% retained. His contract is expiring. Him and Nico Mikola in exchange for Sammy Blay, who <laughs> goes back to St. Louis. Hunter Skinner, a 2023 first with a condition and a 2024 fourth with a condition. Uh, the 2023 first will be the later of New York's first and Dallas's first, which New York uh, owns or owned both. Um, and the third round pick, uh, the fourth becomes a third if the Rangers make the um, third round. So... Big move. Tarasenko makes his way to New York. Patrick Kane gets a potential team to trade for him, uh, cut off from his opportunities. New York is really gearing up for the playoffs. What do you make of this? Who won? Who lost? All of it. This is one of those trades. It's hard to say who won or who lost because this is your prototypical rental trade, right? Like you're, they're giving up a very late first round pick. Um, you know, they get a, a need for their bottom pair in Mikola, and obviously they get a much bigger need with Tarasenko, who will be playing alongside uh, Panarin. And that line has had two very good games since he has joined the team. I I, I feel like it's about right. Um, Sammy Blay, you know, he's just a guy. And, you know, I'm sure St. Louis fans are, are glad to have him back. The first round pick is obviously the key asset here. The goaltender i believe is in the e he's hovered between the e and the a i think mm-hmm. um my favorite part about all this trade actually just happened uh yesterday uh sammy blay went to the new york rangers for the better parts of two seasons only played 54 games scored zero goals for the new york rangers uh scored for the blues yesterday no kidding seriously yeah, yeah. that's yeah. amazing that is my favorite part of this whole trade rangers fans are like if we didn't have tarasenko i'd actually be very pissed off <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um Gives me some hope for the Bertuzzi trade. Yeah. Because uh, on one hand, Tarasenko uh, came back from his shoulder surgeries and absolutely popped off last year. Career high in points, you know, was well over 30 goals. Only has 10 goals this year. 
So a lot of the value was, you know, the hope that he's going to return to what he did last year. Obviously, St. Louis is a much weaker team this year. Uh, the Rangers are a very strong team. He's going to be put in a better opportunity. So this is kind of the, but we can fix him type of trade. Uh, obviously, I don't think to the same degree uh, that Tyler Bertuzzi is going to have. But, yeah, um, you know, it's a it's a fair, fair trade. You know, you see the first round pick in your immediate reaction is always to wince. Like, ooh, that's a lot. One of the Rangers or Dallas is going to be picking in the like 27, 28, 29 range. And the Rangers are very much in their win now mode, so they do not care. I never really thought about this trade until it happened. And what an excellent fit Tarasenko is for New York. And, you know, Panarin and Tarasenko, both countrymen, um, it, it seems like such an obvious fit that I never even really thought about in, you know, first game. Panarin to Tarasenko, like clockwork, a simple goal. Um, so I think it's a trade New York had to make, and it, it seems like a perfect fit so far. I'm happy that Tarasenko gets to play with Panarin. He apparently had petitioned um, St. Louis to sign Panarin when he was available, and they said he's too small. Ouch. That one hurts retroactively for St. Louis. It's also funny, like, it's funny hearing that because St. Louis was the other team that was going to scout Pavel Datsuk back in the day, and their plane got canceled because of a winter storm. They weren't even going to scout Datsuk. Or the same game that he played in. Was it Kalinin or... Yeah, yeah. But that that is funny. Yeah. Um, Good for Tarasenko. You know, I, I agree, Brad, with what you said about it's really hard to discern who won this trade. I, I really love Tarasenko as a player. Before all of his shoulder stuff, I said, this is the closest thing the league will have to Datsuk after Datsuk left. Um, I think there's more to that guy. I don't know if we'll see it because of the shoulder shoulder stuff. Playing in a situation what, where you're not happy and you want to be out, that's got to put a damper on things, right? So if he's happy and he's thriving in the, with the Rangers and he scored on his first shift, um, I could see a lot more being unlocked there. That said, that could be, I'm a very pie in the sky thinker with talented players. I think they're all always going to pan out and, you know, it's going to be the perfect situation. They're going to score 50 goals and that's not how it works in the NHL. So if he comes out and he's just been kind of what he's been in St. Louis for the last little while, then yeah, good on St. Louis for getting something. Uh, there's a lot to figure out with his next contract. I, I can see this. For both teams, those fan bases being happy. St. Louis has to start making moves to think about the next generation of competitive teams. Their window is essentially done here. Um, Ryan O'Reilly is going to be a big decision too. Honestly, talking about Ryan O'Reilly, don't be surprised if we're talking about him down the road. A guy who fits the bill as a Steve Eisman type player. We better, we better not be. I would not be shocked. No, I wouldn't be surprised, but we better not be. Could be. Anyways. He's like... 43 years old. He's not that old. He's the old. same age as me. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, some, right now I feel about 43. You should see the brute. This is Patreon exclusive conversation. I'll save it. Yeah, please do. I was going to say. Yeah. We'll get an update on your bruise that you told us about. I scared myself when I looked in the mirror the other day. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. That could mean a lot of things, so. <laughs> yeah, you're just, you're honestly yeah. so ugly. Yeah. Um, you can see the amount of people who have walked up to me at uh, Wing Wheel Podcast night saying, well, you guys weren't kidding when you talked about Evan. He really does, like, he looks like he's uh, like a, a marble statue. He looks like Ben Affleck. I'm like, yeah. I Literally know. no one says that, Ryan. They do. They're, then Catherine at, paid them off with the lack of money she had. Catherine is happy at those events because she can be free of you for a few minutes. She's not coming to the next one. Uh, I know. Mel's very sad. Well, yeah. she, rightfully so, she saw the Rasmus Anderson scooter incident. <laughs> That's right. Evan, oh, yeah. We didn't. Yeah. Evan tried to warn her. The yeah. number of people who have sent that to me and have been like, <laughs> this is why you can't let Catherine go on the scooters. We'll talk about that on the on the sure, Patreon sure, exclusive sure. after this. I don't know where we're going right now. Anyways. Sorry. Jacob Chikrin. Uh, potentially, it looks like there's a trade. He was sat last night for Arizona. The Arizona PR announced for trade-related reasons. I love that. I think hockey is always so like kind of campy and never really says the obvious. I love that Arizona PR was just like, yeah, this guy that we've been talking about trading for like 18 months now. We're sitting in because there's a trade in the works. Uh, lots of speculation. Nick Kiprios tweeted uh, about three and a half hours ago. Uh, it looks like there's a trade uh, between the LA Kings and Arizona Coyotes, which makes a lot of sense. Centered around, and this is what surprised me, Brent Clark. That is a 
there could be a lot being added here for Arizona. Like you don't know how they made this work. If this ends up being what it is, there's no confirmation yet. But Brant Clark, that's a big haul for them. You want to get a premium player with a good contract and a little bit, of, at least a little bit of term. This is what you have to pay. This is not surprising. I feel like LA is going to have to add here. Um, Cause you know, prospects are always great, but again, like we've talked about for everyone that hits their ceiling, you have five that don't. Right. And you know, Clark's a very, very good prospect and he obviously got a cup of tea with LA this year. So everybody, including LA thinks highly of him. But Jacob Chickren is a known commodity. L.A. is in almost the same position as Detroit is now where it's like it's time to go. You know, they've had a lot of their prospects pan out. They've had a a few key ones miss. Like their situations are very, very similar. This is what you have to do. This is what next year at the this time we hopefully are going to be banging the table telling Steve Eisman to do the same thing. Um, You know, it's Chickren this year and it makes perfect sense because L.A. has a direct need. He's young enough. He's got a little bit of control with his contract left. Yeah, L.A. wants to be contending in the next few years, and Jacob Chikrin is going to help them do that. And Brant Clark, quite honestly, wouldn't be doing that because he'd be too young, too inexperienced. Yeah, this, this trade, without knowing the full details of it, seems to be the, the perfect fit for both the Coyotes in the sense that L.A. has a really good farm system. They had the ability to give up someone like a Brant Clark. And for L.A., who they are very firmly in the go phase of their rebuild. So, you know, it makes, like Evan was saying about Tarasenko to the Rangers, it makes too much sense. It begs a lot of questions, and I think we have an overtime comment about this, about is there going to be interest in Philip Hronik at this trade deadline? No, like there's there's not a doubt in my mind that the Red Wings have received calls on Hronik. We know that there is active shopping of Hronik when the whole Ben Sherratt trade rush happened for defensemen last offseason. But I wonder if anyone is going to call on Hronik this year and what they'd be willing to give up considering what he's done. So there will be, there should be, and Steve Eisenman should hang up. Wow. With, change of pace. With an asterisk. Okay, because this is we've had this conversation and this caveat with a lot of things, and it sounds so stupid. Welcome to the show. To hang so much on one factor, but it, it's a factor. You don't trade Hronik if you're signing Larkin. No, I agree. I agree. But if you're if Steve Eisen is sitting there at the deadline going, I don't think the contract's going to get done with Larkin, then yeah, he absolutely needs to sell high on Hronik. I agree in general. Yeah. I will say, what if someone gives you like a nuclear return? Oh, Hronik? well... Yes. I would trade <laughs> I would trade everybody in the organization for the right return. So that always goes without saying. But being realistic. Not George. Never George. We didn't talk about George. We, gotta, we have to give George a shout out before this. But yeah, like, you know, if someone's coming up, I'm giving you two first round picks in our top prospect. Oh, my God. Yeah, I don't even care what team that is. But realistically, that's not going to happen. You know, so. It's going to come down to what is the core you're building this team around. And if Larkin's gone, they missed out on Horvat. Yeah, now the mandate is going to be build around the 20, 21-year-olds, the 19-year-olds, the 18-year-olds. Okay, if you can get Hronik to add another body to that age group, sure. But given that the most likely outcome is still Dylan Larkin stays at Detroit Red Wing, given that the most likely outcome is the Red Wings are going to keep their foot on the gas pedal this offseason, you have to keep Ronick. The organization doesn't have enough enough depth on the right hand on the right side of the defense. You can't lose him. And let's be honest, Cider Hronik is your top two right D. Don't mind that. Yeah, you don't need to have a deep system at that position because your top four is settled for a good long time. Which is a one of the very, very few luxuries the Red Wings have over a lot of other teams. All right, before we get to overtime here, we should have talked about it for the Vancouver game. One of my favorite traditions that Red Wings fans do at the LCA is not often talked about. It's when they bless the camera operators for and, and uh, whoever directs that show, but they will basically highlight a kid in a Red Wings jersey, maybe a, a young kid, and then they just show fans of the opposing teams, and the crowd just gets into it so fast where they boo the opposing fans and cheer for the kid. Mika was actually the subject of one of this uh 
It was a couple one, years ago. It was one of the very last games at Joe Louis Arena against yeah, the yeah. Islanders. I remember the game well because Danny DeKaiser scored the winning goal with under a minute left. Could, you can't forget moments like, like that. Like that was that was a true rare moment in time. But yeah, it was which was very shortly after uh Mason, right? Was the first kid that had that happen I think to him. So yeah. Like this was like a week after that. Or uh, yeah, only a couple yeah. weeks after that. So still very fresh. And yeah, Mika Mika got that treatment, which was really cool when she was about a year old. And then yeah, this is this is the greatest tradition in sports. <laughs> no, like we have to just make this an every game thing. Yeah. So George, uh, George, who I mean, give George. It was his first NHL game. Uh, they had a sign uh, for him there, and he was he took it. He was obviously having fun, a little shy. Great, honestly, he's such a good memory for the kids. Oh yeah. And as I get older, like the the biological mechanisms in me are switching, and I'm just like I'm like oh my. Earlier, I'd be like, oh, that's really cool for the kid. And now I'm like, wow, that is amazing for the kid. That makes me so deeply happy. Why do I care about this so much? Uh, but very cool for uh, for George. I honestly think the writers should give him tickets to every game because, hey, they played pretty well. So good, keep going. Right? I honestly think when Red Wings fans are into it, they are among the best fans in sports. Like, that's one of the most fun arenas to be in when things are going well. It's been a tough eight years, <laughs> coincidentally. It's actually, I'd call it been tough 10 years ever since... Pretty much everything started going downhill when Danny DeKaiser broke his thumb in 2013. Yeah, um, but that when the that was the last playoff series victory that year. When the Wings give the fans something to cheer for, that arena is a good time. So keep it up, Red Wings fans. The LCA is uh, is and can be among the uh, best in the NHL. All right, uh, let's jump into overtime here, which on this episode of the Wingwheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast. If you want to join the Dub Dub Club, you get access to our Patreon exclusive episodes, which record right after this that we've alluded to, where we answer the, uh, any questions that don't uh, get answered on the main show. There's some bloopers that are added in there. Uh, Evan tells some PG-13 at least stories. The guys can blow off steam. And uh, it's altogether a kind of a, just a... Uh, we shoot the breeze, to put it lightly. Uh, you get access to uh, all of or the Winged Wheel Podcast official Discord, which is a wonderful community. You get entered into all of our giveaways, including uh, we're giving away two tickets to every Detroit Red Wings home game this season, the majority of them exclusive to patrons. So patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast for all that and more. All right, some questions here. Let's go Hockey Town Racing Academy. It says, who would be the 10 teams on your no trade list? That's a good one. Who has the highest income tax? <laughs> of course, that's where Evan goes right Those away. are the top 10. Uh, so the seven Canadian teams are out for Evan. Yeah. I'm oh. playing in like Carolina or Florida, Dallas, Florida, Tampa. Yeah. I'll play in Arizona. Yeah, of course you'll play in Arizona. The golf no, is great. Six people at the game. They paid $8,000 a seat. Golf year round. In no specific order, I'll go Columbus. Um Maybe Anaheim, St. Louis, I am Anaheim. Not. That's a bat. That's bad. I am not crossing any California teams off my list. Absolutely not. Um, I will go Winnipeg, Edmonton, Calgary. I'm just not down for that cold. Ooh, that's tough. I don't know who else I'd add. Toronto. Did nah, you say Toronto? No, I wouldn't cross like major cities off the. <sighs> Must be nice being able to afford all that income tax. I'll go Arizona. You'd be a league men guy too, so you really got to max out that income. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and and you're like an eight million dollar player. That's why you got to worry about it. Exactly. Yeah, more dollars off your paycheck. I'm closer to the Cayman Islands down in Florida. <laughs> you see the difference? Just just. A lot can be decided about uh, us as people just by listening to our answers to this. Yeah. <laughs> Brad, who would you guys add? Hold on. I Okay. Now I need context to my answer. Evan, what salary tier would I be in in the NHL? Because that's going to influence my decision. Well, let's just say everybody's league average. Ryan's overpaid because they f***ed up. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's got, a, everybody's got, I don't know, let's say, I don't even know what league average is. Let's say five and a half million. Oh, oh I'll take hell it. Hell yeah. Okay, so immediately then, all seven of the Canadian teams are off on my list. I am not going to Canada. Um, Chicago, Pittsburgh on my list because I will never get over it. And Boston. Okay. I already told you mine. Whoever has the 10 highest income tax states or provinces, not going there. 
Uh, for anyone laughing at Evan and going, oh, that's ridiculous, please know a lot of players think exactly like that. I think the majority of them do. I, I think I heard a clip from a podcast where agents were talking about how their players basically say, what are the highest income state ta- uh, tax states, provinces? And then they basically say, I don't want to go to any of those unless they're a wagon. Like, let's say, yeah, Colorado, let's say uh, Colorado is like a high income state tax state. Um, they might still go there because you got to play with Kale McCarr and Nathan McKinnon. Yeah. Money and weather. That's what these guys care about. Yeah. Also know that they're moving their family to these places. Like, yeah, you might love the idea of playing in front of Edmonton fans because they're generally really great. But is your family going to love it if you're from Florida originally? Yeah. That's going to be harsh. Oh, yeah. Fam- family considerations. I might have to chop the Florida teams off my list. Hank's a Florida man. What are you talking about? Uh, Hank better not be the Florida man. <laughs> Hank is built for Florida, baby. I do he- not have. No, he's not. You know how much he would sweat in Florida? <laughs> no, nah, but just his general psyche, he has the energy of uh, like someone who just sprints down the road in Florida for no reason. That's Hank. <laughs> Usually it's the bath salts. But. Yeah. So, yeah, even more reason to put the Florida yes. teams on my no trade list. For your and Crystal's. This has teams. been a great question. Yeah, that was a really good question. Thank you for that. Uh, Coyote season tickets in Tempe he says, Congrats on eight years. Thank you very much. Uh, the NBA just had its trade deadline, which took place before its All Star game and 60% of the way through its season. In contrast, the NHL's deadline is when around 75% of the season is over and much later than the All Star game. While I'm not a fan of the soft cap in the NBA, I think the trade deadline timing is something the NHL should borrow. If nothing else, they wouldn't have awkward moments like the Horvat All-Star Game situation. What are your thoughts? I I agree. Um, you know, not only do you avoid those situations, but it gives the acquiring team more time with the player they acquired and it would impact the season more. And I know the answer here is always, oh, well, these teams are free to make trades anytime before then. You, we know how deadlines work and how deadlines force hands. So everybody does their homework the night before. Exactly. So I, I'm in huge favor of moving the deadline up a month or two. Yeah, it raises. You're right. It raises the value of the team trading for the player, which means more assets moved, higher assets moved, which means more fun, which means more transfer of wealth between teams. So if you hate one team sucking forever, you get more for your player. I like it. Yeah, I do. I don't know that like the the effect would be so pronounced. It'll also help make this part of the season seem less murky, right? Like you do the trade deadline late January, early February, and then from February till April, that's your playoff race. You really hone in as a league on focusing on the playoff race. I like it. I do too. Uh, we didn't do it while you're gone, and we obviously didn't do it today, Evan, but we are going to have the um, the playoff format discussion soon because of Crosby's comments uh, at the All-Star game. You see you got tossed? You got a game of conduct last night? What a goon. Yeah, classic Crosby. For it's funny because he must have said something to the refs, or he must have said something to um, it was Mikey Anderson, whatever it was. It was enough for a game misconduct, and uh, you know Crosby had a reputation when he first came into the league of he just yapped too much at the refs, and to see him get tossed for what looked like nothing, I was like, huh, it's funny that that's his first. Uh, Ariel Rojo says, if you were creating your own hockey team and didn't have to conform to classic boring hockey tropes, what would be your mascot and what would the team colors be? You know, I'll say Seattle took the Kraken from me. I really liked the Kraken. Um, this isn't answering your question, but I desperately wanted Vegas. I've said this before to be black, pink, and white and be the flamingos. I'm a big like Miami Vice color scheme type. Oh of guy. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like neon, the, the all star jerseys that we just had. Yeah, those things absolutely rocked. I. L- I like purple primaries. Yes. I think yes. there is so much potential in a purple primary. I almost don't even care what the same color is. Yeah. There's a lot of ways you could go with that. Uh, big fan of that. As I've never put any thought into the mascot, though. The LA Kings are are screwing up by leaning into the black and white and silver and not purple and gold. Purple and gold is such a phenomenal. And even if you want it to be purple and black, purple and white, whatever, purple is such an underutilized color. What's a good mascot that could go with like a purple and gold theme? Grimace. <laughs> My God. Yeah. Hey, why did you come up with that so I fast? Have, I have no idea. <laughs> Your brain is either Swiss cheese or the most densely, like, dense matter brain Depends in Depends on the second you catch me. Oh, my God. <laughs> just just lean into the sellout of it all and, like, contact Marvel. <laughs> like, you yeah. get the naming rights to our team. Yeah. And so we put a team 
So where where are the Florida Panthers? They're in Sunrise, right? Mm-hmm. Cool. I am the Miami Black Panthers. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <We're> just... <laughs> I yeah, I'd have to think about the mascot. I'm uh, and the oh, black the, and purple would work. The Atlanta Ant Men. That's great too. Atlanta. Then that account's defunct. The Atlanta Thrashers like meme account. Oh, just use the same arena. It's still there. <laughs> it's probably free. Yeah, that's another good one. Um, all right, Wyoming Wings fan says, "Is there a hey, maybe you'll see Evan when he goes to fictional Jackson Hole, Wyoming?" I, uh, I very much hope so. Uh, is there a path to the playoffs next year if the Wings trade Bertuzzi at the trade deadline or lose him in the off season, or does that restart the rebuild clock like Larkin would? Nope. The, it, <laughs> I love Bert, but it doesn't affect it. Watch the Red Wings right now and say if they added whatever realistic pieces at the deadline or in the offseason, could they make the playoffs? That's your answer because right now Bertuzzi is not factoring into games a lot. Yeah, he's played like 10% of the season. So, um, Is there a path to the playoffs if they lose Bertuzzi? I think yes. I will say it looks like a steep climb right now. Yeah, that's keeping Larkin. That's probably making one or two more significant additions in the offseason. That's a full season of Berggren replicating what he's doing now. That's Marco Casper coming in and having a, a pretty solid rookie season. That's Edvinson coming in and having a solid rookie season. That's All, Raymond Insider taking a step. That is a lot of things that have to go right, but the at least we're in the situation now. Casper and Edvinson having good rookie seasons. Not a crazy thought. Eisenman acquiring someone in the offseason. Not a crazy so- thought. Larkin re-signing. A very likely thought, like, yeah, it's a lot of things that has to happen, but it's not like you're we're we're reaching for the oh my god we have to sign Steven Stamkos thing anymore. Now this is for playoffs. If if you want to talk path to the cup over the next three years, then we got to start reaching for some things. Uh, question here from Reed says, which Wings prospect that never made the team is the most disappointing for you guys? For me, it was Joe Hicketts. I loved his energy and had high hopes after his World Juniors performance. Honorable mention to Dominic Terjean as he was our local Portland Winterhawks captain. Ooh, good answers. Never made it or didn't or like played, but they weren't that good. The for the latter, Furk and Yurko for me. Yurko was gonna be mine. Yeah. Uh, never made it. That one's tough. Oh, let's look at the Red Wings draft history. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I'm okay. Yeah, I you, I've I've taken to doing that from time to time, and it's really kind of illustrated how crummy things have been um it's not too late but to he was he was never supposed to he was a seventh round pick so he's never guaranteed to be anything i have my answer i just want to find someone a little more recent Ooh, let's take a look here uh Vili sorry yarvi Vili sorry yarvi is one actually that's yeah that's who I, think. I remember that's we had the some, good recent we had one. some high hopes for him at one point yeah. and it just fell off a cliff yeah absolutely fell off a cliff he looked like really good and then all of a sudden nothing yeah the real answer here is Thomas McCollum. That was Ooh. I was honestly thinking that, and I was like, I can't remember the context around him, so I didn't want to say it. Hey, drafting a goalie in the first round, it always works out. Never misses. <sighs> All right, time for a few Reddit questions here before we wrap up. The Super Bowl is currently happening. It is 14-14 uh, with 10 minutes left in the second quarter. About. I think I missed my first square already. Great. Uh, background junket 35 says, what do you guys think Berggren's or Berggren's ceiling is? He's looked really good so far. Second line winger, power play specialist. Honestly, I can see him being floating between the first and second lines as a productive winger. Like I, I don't see him as like a superstar hundred point player, but um, I could see him crazy to say like a better version of Gus Nyquist. Yeah, that's probably fair. Like uh, uh, he, his offensive IQ makes his ceiling very, very, very high. He's, he, he's, he, yeah, he's got the IQ to be that kind of player who could play a super long career and be, you know, relatively productive in the top, top six, and you don't even really think about it. You're just yeah. like, wow, that guy's played 800 games, and he's got 500 points. Yeah, the, the sky's the limit for him, and he seems to have the right attitude as well. Uh, Cortiva says, how many moves do you guys anticipate uh, being made by the team at the deadline? Three. I'll say this is an active one. I'll say four at least. I'm going to say three. Four would be a lot. Two forwards and a defenseman. 
Wow, where, where are we getting for Ben Sherratt? <laughs> we haven't even talked about that. Same return as, as he got last year for oh, Montreal. Yes, Boy, are you going to be di- disappointed when you find out it's Stephen Kampfer. Yeah. <laughs> <Don't>, Robert Hag. <laughs> don't threaten me with a good time, Brad. <laughs> I'll say I'll say two, but the caveat is one is done before the trade deadline, before trade deadline day. Oh, okay. I was going to say. Well, actually, they can happen after the deadline. But that's a whole other can of worms. Um. E. Clark says, what's a realistic return on the Bertuzzi trade, which we chatted about? What's Detroit's answer for his replacement on the ice? I want to say he's worth it first, but this year hasn't been kind to him, so I'm not sure if that hurts his trade value. He got injured twice blocking shots, so has to count for something. So we we talked about his trade value, but what about his answer for the replacement on the ice? And I think the fact of the matter is, is that not only do the Red Wings not have one, he's a tough player to find. Like It's tough to find players like Bertuzzi in the league. Which is why he has value, even though he's not had a good year. They've already been replacing him all year. That's the reality of it. What you've seen is what you're going to get because that's what they've been doing. Because he's barely played. If you want, like, uh, who's going to fill that role? Not necessarily that position. Uh, Marco Casper, tenacious. Will get into the dirty areas. Will punch you in the face. Will score on you. They will obviously. He, they want Casper to be better than Bertuzzi, which is a high bar. Bertuzzi at his best is very good. Uh, but even Casper could play at the wing to start his career, right? That's probably who they have in mind when they're like, all right, we're losing a little bit of edge, but Casper could bring in a hard nose. And that player could be drafted this year? Yeah, could be. Fantilli got a Gordie Howe hat trick against MSU. That was great. I'll, you know what? We'll make it easy for the NHL. Keep Fantilli in Michigan. He'll still, he'll just play for Detroit. I'll take it. Cost him moving these days. It's just, it's a lot. It's too high. He's a kid. Like, you don't want to make him go through all that, do you? Man. It would it would hurt. How would you feel if Red Wings won the lottery but went to the second spot? Like they won the second lottery spot and they got Fantilli because that that's a that's, I would do a backflip, but I would be bitter about it forever. It's tough, right? Because Fantilli looks like a player, and it's not even necessarily him. Like Detroit loves their Swedes. It could be Leo Carlson, but Fantilli looks like a player. I, I would be conflicted for sure. I I would enjoy it and I would be happy. But I would be a petty asshole who complains about finally winning the draft lottery after 10 years only to still somehow miss out on Connor Bedard. Oh, Brad, you, you think we're petty on this show? I'm keeping that in my back pocket till literally the day I die. I, Actually, no, I'm keeping that in my back pocket until the Red Wings win a cup. Still remember the first time someone was like, hey, uh, love the show, but sometimes you guys get hung up on stuff that happened in the past and you need to stop whining about it. And I went, Yeah. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> That's very fair. Are you, you think you, you're better than me? Yeah. <laughs> no, the, the answer there was, you are correct, but we are not going to listen. <laughs> I'll remember this forever. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No better note than that to wrap up this episode, folks. Thank you for the last eight years uh, of tuning in. When we talk about the um, accomplishments of the show, it's it should be noted that none of that happens without you. Uh, the best community we could have ever asked for uh, all of you who have listened uh, all of you who are new listeners uh, we can't say thank you enough um, all of our patrons who have supported us like this show happens because of you anything that gets better is because of you so to all of our patrons thank you so seriously um, and here's to the next 8 10 15 we don't know how many years hopefully we just have more playoff series wins to talk about all right, we'd like to thank all of our patrons our name level supporters on patreon Arjun Shanker Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Ground Foundation Ake Fur, Armchair GM slash Genius, Nick Perks, Terry, Driver of the Number 69, Cry and Ryan, Hannah's Banana Slam and Jamathong, Glenn Brabham, Aiden White, Keenan O'Donohue, Johnny Burgers, or Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Mitch's Nicotine Patch, GoFundMe, Babe Landeskog, Carl Brutana, Nanaluski, Chimmy, Chris P., Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight Probert, Red Hot, Ronick, Hassam Al Kassem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Joseph Barry, Kalen Wood, Kevin James, King Tone, Las Ensaladas Picantes, Marcus, Massive Wong, Evan Longsaber, Matt McKay, Michael Edlin, Nadelkovic, goalie number one, Nicholas Fritz, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Send It Sea Wolf, That's What I Appreciate About You, Top Chopstick, Shops, Stock Top Chopsticks. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think that's Arjun. Uh, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, Antonio Gracias, Ben Barron, noted Philip Zadina whisperer and proud member of the Jake Wallman Gritty Club. Brad Simmons, uh, Brian Vasha, Carl Thames, Connor Leighton, Darren Fick, Philip Zadiznuts, 
George's biggest fan, Grand Rapids hockey guy, Griffey Boy, Heronix Handlebar, James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Lieutenant Matt S. of the Cheesebag Army, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Ophelia, Reed, Stephen, The Hodag, The Romantic Dreams Brad Has About Eric Carlson, and finally my favorite patron, Matt Keeper. Thank you all so much, and we will talk to you later this week. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.